It's green. There we go. All right. Thank you. I haven't been up here enough to catch those signals right, you know. No, I was just going to say, though, there are lots of ideas and things that Preacher has, and of course, he blames some of it on me, too, you know, the ideas and whatnot. But we can only lead as far as people are willing to follow. And even in that, we need people to step up. I mean, I can't take leadership in everything. Preacher can't take leadership to each of these groups and lead to someone's house. And it is important that we have people step up and say, well, Preacher, why don't we do this? And, well, why don't you do that? And why don't you go ahead and set up the group and lay it out? And, and even something this simple, and it is simple, really, truly, you can go out there and you can stand there and smile, bring your kids. He, he was correct. You know, Miss Shaver was sitting there looking around the edges at Wesley and Caleb and, Tim, you know, these, these kids just loving it. And all you had to do is come and smile, be an encouragement, be a blessing. She was asking how you all are, asking about the ladies that are pregnant and, and when they're due and asking about the families and the things that are happening around here. And it's just, it was, a, it was a good visit, but I'll come back to it again. Even something as simple as that does require things to happen behind the scenes. It requires someone to throw together the uh, addresses and the song lists and, and coordinate to get the groups together and go out there. And it takes people stepping up. And I think that it is great that that was put forward and that there are people stepping up and doing it. And I guarantee we will be out there again. So I'm looking forward to it. Let's look in God's word this evening in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. We're going to read about a kidnapping, first of all, here. Genesis chapter 14. We're going to read verses 8 through 24 to start with. And let's all stand for the reading of the scripture. Let's all stand just for a moment here. Genesis chapter 14, verses 8 through 24. Genesis 14 verses 8 through 24. I'll read out loud if you'll follow along with me. It says, And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim. When Chedorlaomer, now if you're, if you're looking for any names, Jake, for your, your new child, you know, a few names in here you might want to write down. Um, Chidor Laomer, that's L-A-O-M-E-R, yeah. The king of Elam with Tidal, or Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, the king of Shinar, and Arioch, the king, or king of Elisar, four kings with five. And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountains. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals, that's food, for those of you that don't know, victuals, and they went and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's, brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. And there came one that had escaped, and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkel, and brother of Abner, and these were confederate with Abraham. And when Abram, Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left side, left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shavit, which is the king's dale. Now here's the part I want to focus on this evening. That stuff is background, but here's what I want to focus on and I'll bring to light more in detail. Verse 18 onward. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. No, this is not a message about tithes, but there it is, first mentioned in the scriptures. Again, before the law was ever given, there were tithes. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons, and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, 
I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, at Aner, Eshkel, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you would please uh, lead and guide in the message this, this evening. I pray you would speak to hearts. Help me to say what you want me to, nothing more, nothing less. And I pray you would help us to lead this evening closer to you and ready to serve you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So here again, we have the story of Lot. He's been kidnapped by a consortium, if you will, of kings. His city has been plundered. The Bible is specific. It says all the goods and all the food were taken. I believe it in every word Bible. I think that every detail that it's in God's word is correct. And it's, it's interesting, when you look through this, there are certain things that are going to jump out to you, or maybe, maybe they do to you, maybe not, I don't know. But I was reading here, through here, it says that all the goods were taken from the city, all the victuals were taken from the city, if you will. But when it says that it was returned, it doesn't mention anything about the food. So they returned all the goods, they returned the people, but apparently they didn't get back all their food. Maybe it was some good food, I, I don't know. Maybe, are these the things that only I notice as I read? My goodness, I'm, I'm sorry. But they returned all the goods. Abraham, uh, Uncle Abraham, if you will, came to rescue his nephew Lot with his 318 trained servants. And that's a whole other thing about you know, being prepared to defend yourself and your family. But they attacked these captors at night. They were victorious. They pursued them. And in the end, Abraham and his men rescued Lot and the other captives, returned all the goods. Now, it's interesting, if you look at the time frame and the timeline here, Abraham was more than 75 years old. And I believe it was chapter 12, his age is mentioned before this. So this is an old man going out to battle to rescue his younger nephew. Now, as he comes back here, sorry to offend anyone that's 75 years old. As he comes back here from this rescue operation, the king of Sodom, returns from hiding and wherever he had fallen in these slime pits here and came to meet Abram. You know, like a lot of these politicians will do, you know, they hide when there's trouble and there's something that they actually have to do and difficult decisions and, and they're nowhere to be found. But here comes Abraham after taking care of business, rescuing his nephew, rescuing the people and their goods, and he comes out to greet him. What can I do for you? How can I reward you? You know, I'm the leader here and I don't know what he's doing, but, you know, showing up there at least. And we see this interaction between Abram Melchizedek, and the king of Sodom. Now both Abraham and Lot have just seen the Lord work in an amazing way. They both seen the great blessing of the Lord. Lot had been rescued from the enemy kings. Abraham had just seen victory and success in battle with his trained servants. But here we see two different reactions. First, we see Abraham speak up and proclaim the power and glory of God. In verses 22 through 24, he talks about the most high possessor of all and the great things that God has done for him. Then we see silence from Lot. We see him sitting next to the gate of Sodom next. That's the next thing we, we see mentioned of him. We don't see any mention of him praising the Lord, anything, him thanking the Lord in any way. We see Abraham Abraham, I'm going to use that interchangeably because we call him Abraham. Um, we see Abraham bragging on the Lord here. We see Abraham insulting the king even as he gives him a lesson on who truly possesses the heaven and earth. And we hear nothing from Lot, the one who was just rescued from captivity, just delivered from his kidnappers. Now both Abraham and Lot had the same opportunity, but only one of these men opened their mouths. Only one of these men gave honor and glory to God. Only one of these men lifted up the name of the Lord and separated himself from this wicked city and its rulers. The other never said anything worth mentioning in Scripture. He went along with everyone else and ended up in the same place as those leaders of that city. And this evening, as we look at this passage, I want to ask you, who are you today? Are you an Abram or are you a Lot? Every one of us stands in a similar position. We stand before God who has blessed us in, in every way, truly. He's given us salvation, redeemed us from the sentence of sin. Let me say it again. He's given us salvation. 
He's redeemed us from the sentence of sin. He's given us safety and prosperity. Brother, Brother Klassen mentioned it today, just how good God has been to us. You know, I, I hope that, that we don't take it for granted, the health that God has given us in the midst of what's going on. You know, coronavirus is real. We're not up here denying that it's real. You know, we can talk about the hype and what it's made out to be and what it really is. But at the same time, it is amazing that God has given us the safety that he has here and the health that he has here. Do not take that for granted. He's given us safety. He's prospered us. We stand before a watching Sodom, if you will. The world's out there. They're watching how we treat the blessings of God. They're ready for us to open our mouths. They're ready for us to speak of his protection. They're ready for us to speak of his provision. They're ready for us to lift up the name of our Savior and ready for us to tell of his holiness and of his judgment that's coming. And today I want to ask you again, will you be an Abraham or will you be a Lot? Will you open your mouth and stand strong for the Lord or will you close it and take the path of least resistance? The words that come out of your mouth or don't come out of your mouth can say a lot about a person's heart. Luke 6, 45 says, A good man out of the treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. And when we have a person that's silent about the blessings of God, you wonder what's in your heart. What are you focusing on if you're not focusing on the blessings of God? I know that there were other indicators in Lot's life that showed us where he was spiritually. That is to say, that he was spiritually bankrupt. But here's another. He would not open his mouth and speak of what the Lord had done for him. And unfortunately, Lot is like many Christians today. God blesses us in these obvious and amazing ways. He provides opportunities for us to speak his goodness, and we sit mute. As we sit here right now with everything that's going on around in the world, people are more fearful and, and concerned and talking about the issues that are around us. I don't think there's ever been a, a more opportune time to share the gospel and to share what Christ has done in our lives and the difference that he makes in our lives than right now in the midst of what we're going through. And yet we sit mute. 2 Samuel 22.50 says, Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. Isaiah 25.1 says, O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Acts 2, verse 46 and 47, about the early church, it says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. What does it say next? Praising God and having favor with all the people. Psalm 63, verses 3 and 4, and we could go on and on, especially in the book of Psalms, but I tried to pick some from several places around the scriptures that says, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. And let me say this evening, the, the believer has no excuse for silence. There is no excuse. God's word is clear that his creation and his people ought to be proclaiming his praises. We sang the song this morning, let's talk about Jesus, the King of Kings. How many of you sang that from the time you were, you were young? I love that song. I really do. I appreciated seeing that this morning. Uh, but we ought to talk about Jesus. And not just here in church where we have opportunity. Yes, it does start here in the church, but it ought not end there. Your coworkers ought to know that Monday morning you're going to come in excited about what God did at church on Sunday. Your family ought to expect that your praise for the Lord is forthcoming as he blesses you. Oh, he's going to come over here again telling us what the Lord did for him this week and what the Lord did for him and his family this month. It ought to be something that, that they expect. Your boss ought to hear you give credit to the Lord for the good things that happen as you're at the workplace, for the overtime opportunities, for that bonus, for the things that the Lord does through you in the work that you do at your workplace. It doesn't happen just at church. But I will say also, if you cannot stand up for a testimony in church among supportive believers that want to hear God's blessing, 
with a preacher that sits up here and says, you know, anyone else? Anyone else tonight? If you're not going to stand up and give a testimony in church before supported believers, I have a hard time believing that you're going to stand up, as the scriptures say, before the heathen and lift up the name of the Lord. It is a dangerous position to be in, to stand in rebellion to such clear scriptural commands about praising the Lord. It sounds odd. We're talking, you call that rebellion? Yes. When God says that we're supposed to stand up and praise his name before the people around us, and we sit silent, we are in rebellion. And we're going to talk about some of the dangerous fruits that come from that in just a moment here. It is a dangerous position to be in. And thanks here to the pages of scripture, we can fast forward through the life of Lot. We can look into his future and see the fruit of a closed mouth Christian. And Brother Mark, if that's what you want to take as the title tonight, you can stick that on there, the fruit of a closed mouth Christian. Lot's closed mouth and weak testimony bore troubling, and even more than that, dangerous fruit later in his life. We're going to look at Genesis 19 tonight, the story of the visiting angels. We're going to skip ahead to another story. Let's look there right now, Genesis chapter 19. And while you're turning here, we're going to see in the story of visiting angels, we're going to see the fruit of Lot's silence made clear in Genesis 19, verses 1 through 26. The first fruit that we see here in this passage, we're going to read this chapter first. I'm going to read chapter 19 in its entirety. I'm not going to make you all stand again, but I want to read it so that you can hear the story again. It says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Again, the next mention of Lot, this is where we see him. Lot seeing them, and Lot seeing them, arose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet. And ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Wow, this is, this is a sad state of affairs when the angels were not willing to turn in for a place to stay with Lot. I mean, it, again, just indicators all throughout this of where he is spiritually here. Verse 3, And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in, to, in unto him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. You've seen those people, sometimes they come to the door, you know, while you're out soul winning, and they come stand and they shut the door behind them so you don't see, you know. I, I picture Lot there, you know, he, he doesn't want them to see, and he doesn't want them to have access to his house. He shuts the door behind him there and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly, trying to cover this up and keep them away from these angels that have come to visit. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes, only come only unto these men, do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. We just can't even get into the wickedness and, and his logic that he's going through here. Verse 9, And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow, talking about Lot, came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because of the cry, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, 
And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, and look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my lord. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. I know that some people feel that way about the wilderness and going camping. <laughs> Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, it is a, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for that which, for the, for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen up upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. We're going to stop right there. As I look through this passage here, just looking forward at Lot's life, I saw some connections to that silence that he, that he had exhibited in chapter 14. The first fruit that we see here in this passage, in Lot's life, the first dangerous fruit we see here is expected compliance. Look in verse 5 of chapter 19. Verse 5 of chapter 19. They, Lot has these men in his house now. The people have gathered around, and they called unto Lot and said unto him, where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. These wicked men that came to do wicked things with these visitors assumed that Lot would help them do evil. They expected him to comply with them. And let me say that when you stand silent in the midst of a wicked world, the world assumes that you are their accomplice. Let me say it again. When you stand silent in the midst of a wicked world, the world assumes that you are their accomplice. When you never open your mouth, don't be surprised when a coworker tells a dirty joke around you and expects you to enjoy it. That's what's going to happen. They expect compliance. They expect you to enjoy it. They think you're one of them. Don't be surprised when a friend shares pornographic images with you. Don't be surprised when your boss gives you a bottle of wine as a Christmas gift. Don't be surprised when your family member invites you to that family reunion with booze. Don't be surprised when people take God's name in vain around you and expect you to have no problem with it. Don't be surprised when people expect you to have no problem with their cheating and lying and stealing in the workplace and expect you to punch them in as they come in late or punch them in at the right time as they leave early. Or don't expect them to be any different because you are their accomplice in their mind because you've never spoken up. When you stand silent, the world takes it as affirmation. Lot's life and testimony before the inhabitants of this wicked city emboldened their plans and acts of sin. Lot's keeping his mouth shut actually increased the peer pressure that was eventually put on himself. Lot's keeping his mouth shut caused them to give him more trouble later. If he had, if he had simply originally came there and said, here's what I am. I'm a Christian. I'm a servant of the Lord. I worship the Lord. These are the things I do and I don't do. They, they wouldn't have been there at his house begging him to give them these men that had come in if he had taken that stand earlier. But he added to his trouble by keeping silent. And I ask you this evening, what about you? Are you feeding the world's expectation of compliance? I'll say tonight, open your mouth, Lot. Open your mouth. Don't stand silent. But not only did it lead to this dangerous fruit of expected compliance, but it also led to exasperating inconsistency. Verse 9, let's look in verse 9. In the same chapter, verse 19, or chapter 19 and verse 9. It says, and they said, stand back. And they said again, talking about Lot here. Here's, here's what I want you to focus on. This one fellow 
came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge? Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And we continue on here. But what, what they saw is they said, this man, he came here to us. He came to live amongst us. He came to sojourn here with us, and now he's going to judge us? He chose us. He chose this place. He chose this city. He chose this church. And now he's going to sit here and he's going to complain? And they were exasperated with his inconsistency. They said, Lot chose the company and influence of this city. Now he wants to criticize us. He came to live among us. He knows who we are. He knows how we live. Don't complain all of a sudden, Lot. Why are you speaking up now? Lot's inconsistency angered them. Some of you think that one day you're going to stand up for truth and right and vindicate your faith as a Christian. But if some of you have never stood up for what's right, if some of you ever stood up for what is right, those of you around, those, of, uh, those people that are around us would just laugh and say, wait a second, is this the same person that's been laughing along at those dirty jokes? Is this the same person that didn't have a problem with this and didn't have a problem with that and never stood up at this point and didn't care when this happened? But now he's going to judge us. Now he thinks he's the one who's going to criticize us here. He said, you chose our company. You enjoyed spending time with us. You stood silently by all these years, and now you're going to act like you're not one of us. You're going to protect these angels. And you're going to act like this is something that's wrong that we're doing. Let me say, don't wait till that moment to open your mouth. Speak up now. Make it easier for yourself. Set that pattern and testimony of consistency. I'll ask you, does silence, does your silence make it hard for you to be consistent in your life as a Christian? There's, sometimes it's hard. I know it is. You know, when something happens and, and it's, it's hard to step up in that moment and say, wow, I, I don't agree with that. That's not right. I can't, I can't condone that. I can't, I can't affirm that in this. And I'm not saying you have to sit there and criticize and be like, put that down, smack the cigarette out of their finger. No, that's not what I'm talking about. But you don't have to stand there and watch it. You don't have to let them think that you agree with it. You can say something in a Christ-like way that shows where you're at in that situation. Don't let your silence cause you trouble later. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Not only was there the dangerous fruit of his expected compliance, his exasperating inconsistency, but Lot's silence also bore the fruit of escalated confrontation. Let's look in verse 9 again here. He says, we, Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. He says, oh yeah, they said, oh yeah, you're going to stop us now. You're going to step up now and speak to us after all these years, after you came to live here, and now you're going to criticize us. We're going to make it worse for you now than we are for those that, that are visiting. We're going to destroy your home. We're going to hurt you. We're, we're going to take it even further than you expected. Now, many people think that they're waiting for the perfect time to talk about God to reveal their faith. You know, one day they're going to, here I am, this is me. I'm the believer. I'm a Christian. Aren't you glad to hear it? No. There is no perfect time. We live in the world. We live among sinners. We live among people who honestly pass on into eternity every day. There is no perfect time to wait for. So you wait. And you wait. And you wait. When in reality, you're building up expectations and tensions that will make your conversation even harder. Really? I never knew you were a Christian. I never would have guessed. Oh, so that's how you really feel about it. All this time you've been hiding it. So you've been secretly criticizing us all this time while you go to that church and you never wanted to tell us. Be, just be consistent. Just lay it out there. Let people know where you stand. And it doesn't escalate that confrontation. These men were angered at the deceit of Lot's silence. Had Lot spoken up sooner, there could have been a simple separation. But because he would not open his mouth, it led to a violent confrontation. And that's, that, we see that pattern borne out in people's lives all the time. They're not, willing to make, they're not willing to deal with the problem right away. They're not willing to let people know where they stand right away. Not willing to speak up for the Lord right now. And it brings it and it draws it out into something that's bigger and harder and worse. And many times Christians just end up backing down from it. I'll tell you what, there are a lot of Christians that wouldn't have even done what Lot did, stand up in front of those angels. They sat there all that time in, in that city, and they hobnobbed with those, those leaders in this wicked city, and these people came to know them, and they were friends. They would have just 
handed them over. They would have just said to those, those angels, why don't you just, just scoot through town quick? Get out of here so I don't have to deal with this. Lot actually stood up, but a lot of Christians in our society today wouldn't even do that because it, it wouldn't fit with the pattern that they've already laid out. These men were exasperated with their consistency and it ended up with an escalated confrontation. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Not only did he have, did they expect compliance, they were exasperated with his consistency, they were, they escalated their confrontation, but also it led to evangelistic coldness. In verse 14, verse 14 it says, And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up! Oh, get you out of this place! He'd finally been convinced that they needed to get out. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. He seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. What a sad testimony. They laughed at Lot when he tried to warn him. When Lot spoke of the power of God, when Lot spoke of the holiness of God, when he spoke of the coming judgment of God on this wicked city, his sons-in-law laughed at him. They thought it was a joke. Now, of all the people in the city, you know, I'm sure that he had close friends. He had people that, were, that he spent a lot of time with, maybe that he worked with, that he spent time in the gate with, uh, if you will, in his, in his position. But if there, were, if there was anyone that you could say saw Lot's life, even behind the scenes of what he spoke and, and said, that knew who he was, these men were the ones that had the closest view into Lot's life. These were the ones over whom Lot had the very most influence. These were the ones that probably knew him the best. And when he spoke about God and his judgment and what he wanted them to do, they laughed at him. Where is the gospel in your life? Do your neighbors see it? Do your coworkers see it? Does your family see it? Or would they laugh at you telling, about them, telling them about their sin problem? Would they assume that you're joking when you tell them that Jesus saves? <laughs> that, that's a good... Oh, you're serious. You actually, you actually go to church? You, you're a believer? You're, you're a Christian? Wow. I, I never would have guessed that. Let me ask you this evening, does your silence turn the gospel into a joke? Has your silence brought evangelistic coldness? Not only did it bring expectation of compliance and sin, not only did it exasperate them in his inconsistency, not only did it escalate that confrontation or bring evangelistic coldness, but Lot's silence finally or the dangerous fruit of extreme calamity. We're talking about physical harm and danger here. Verse 26, we're going to look at the end here, the last verse we read. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Think about that for a minute. She became a pillar of salt. I think there are certain stories in God's Word that are so fantastic, and we hear them as young people. You know, you think of the animals getting onto the ark, and, you know, David and Goliath, and there are some of these stories, and I think that Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt is one of those amazing stories that you hear as a young person, and it gets ingrained in your mind, and sometimes you just don't even think about how unusual and what, it actually, what actually happened here. Lot lost his wife. She became a pillar of salt. We believe, again, in an every word Bible, right? This is what happened. Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt. He lost his wife in this judgment. No, she didn't burn up with fire and brimstone, but it was God's hand of judgment, just as sure and just as dramatic as if she had perished in the midst of that wicked city. Even in the midst of the violent expression of God's hatred, it amazes me what, what Lot was still trying to do. Let's look back, and I'll, and I'll show you where we're heading with this. I'm going to bring you back and lead you back into this. Let's look back in verse 18. I'm going to read verses 18 through 20, uh, 23 here. And we're going to look at this again. So Abram knows, or I'm sorry, Lot knows what's going on here wrong. He knows that this place, this judgment is coming. The angels have impressed upon him. He believes it. He's even talked to his, uh, his sons-in-law and people around him. They're not listening to him. So they get dragged out of the city here. It's interesting. He lingered in verse 16. They laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And it says they brought him forth. He was still waiting around there. But in verse 18, what is he trying to do here? Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant 
hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Even in the midst of this violent expression of God's hatred, Lot was begging to reside in another wicked city. He says, I know it's a wicked place. I know it's a place that you're going to judge, but it's just a little place. It's not as bad as the big city. It's just a, a little wickedness over here. I, I want to go over here. Zor was bound for a similar judgment to Sodom and Gomorrah. They were a sister city, if you will, of Sodom and Gomorrah. They joined together in battle, we saw in chapter 14. Lot first, and then the family that he led, were infatuated with the lifestyle of these sinful cities. Let me say we have many Christians that are in the same situation today. They can't imagine the promises of God as being better than what they're experiencing now. They can't see the rewards of God as improving on what the world is already serving them day after day. I mean, how could a church service be more interesting and more helpful than my favorite TV show that I can stay home and watch? I mean, they can't imagine it. They're infatuated with the lifestyle of the world. And I know who I'm preaching to. I'm preaching to those that are here on Sunday night. But yet, if we look at our own lives, we would admit that there are areas where we become infatuated with the world and the things of the world. Begging God to just let their worldly lifestyles continue unmolested. He says, if I went out to the wilderness like God sent me away from these wicked cities, I don't even know if I could live there. I don't know what I'd do. And I think that some people say, you know, I, I don't know what I'd do if I, I couldn't watch my favorite TV show, if I didn't have the, uh, these things that I'm interested in following from the world and the music and these friends that are, that are not leading me in the right. I don't even know where I'd go. What, what would I do? How, how would I live without that? They're infatuated with that worldly lifestyle. And knowing that and seeing Lot here beg to be able to head to another wicked city, it should not come as any wonder that Lot's wife could not keep her eyes off of Sodom and Gomorrah. She turned her eyes back to the city that she loved. It was turned into a pillar of salt. We saw here that Lot lingered so long in the city beforehand that the angels had to forcibly, physically drag he and his family from Sodom. I know that Lot was neglecting his fatherly leadership and, and his fatherly duties in many areas more than just this. But fathers, let me say your family can only be drugged so far before they turn around and look back. You know, it, it's hard. It's hard sometimes, preachers, seeing, you know, t people get to the teenage years of their kids' lives and they, we're going to do right now. I see how important it is. I see the judgment's finally coming. The fire's going to fall. And they may not see fire falling on in judgment here, you know, physically on the cities that we're in, but they see the ramifications. They see the danger when it comes to the teenagers' lives. It's become real to them that in just a few years, my daughter could be in, in, in amazing, crazy places out of the will of God and, and in danger and hurting in serious ways. They say, all right, now we're going to get serious, family. We're going to be in church now three times a week. We're going to be reading God's word as a family every day. We're going to do these things. And at a certain point where you've drug them, <laughs> at a certain point, I'm going to say it, it gets to be too late. You put all this time and effort and allowed them to go and do whatever. And you've showed them that the world is so wonderful and it tastes so great. And these are the things that we're going to follow after. And this is what we're going to do. And all of a sudden you're going to change it. And you expect that in a couple months, your teenagers are going to be you know, on board with where you're at after years of you leading them down this path. And Lot had led his family down this path of wickedness and worldliness for years and years. And the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how long it is, but you don't get to be a leader in a city like this, just walking into the city and you become it. You assume that he was there for years leading his family in this, and then all of a sudden he expects to drag him out of the city and follow the Lord's commandment and obey the angels and do right. And his wife turns around to look back. Let me say fathers, because it, it, is, it is on fathers of families, mothers too. You need to help portray this. But you need to open your mouth. You need to cast a vision for your family 
of what the Lord has done for you. Tell them about the goodness of God. Tell them what he has in store for them. We have fathers that are more concerned about the sports their kids play and making sure that they're safe and eligible and ready for the sports and you know, that they're going to be able to be in the marching band and they're going to be able to do this and these extracurricular activities and, and whatever they're doing than they are about their spiritual well-being. And when you don't lift up the name of the Lord, something else will fill that void. There will be sports and outdoors activities and hobbies and education. And, and these are not wicked things in and of themselves, but any of these things that take the place of what God has in store for us and for our families, following him spiritually, they become a danger. And let me say the devil stands in the wings ready to promise anything you desire, anything that will take your eyes off of the will of God. We need some fathers that will cast a vision for what God has in store for their family. First of all, they need to see it themselves. I'll just say that. We need some men that, first of all, are in God's word. Don't, don't start having a family, and maybe I could be wrong in this, preacher. You correct me if I'm wrong, and this is not what you want me to say, but fathers, before you, before you get your family together and expect everyone to sit around while you read God's word, why don't you get in God's word first yourself? Why don't you set a pattern yourself where your kids know that you're in God's word. They know where daddy's at every morning at 6 a.m. They know where daddy's at every, every morning before, before he heads to work. They know where, what he's doing every night before he heads to bed. They know where, what he's reading, where he's going. When you set that pattern, it makes it a lot easier for you to step up and say, all right now, I want everyone to come to the dinner table and we're going to read God's word. But when you're not doing it yourself, it, it's, it's hard for you to cast that vision and lead them in it. Are you turning the eyes of your family to Jesus and to his goodness? Or is your silence leading them to the death and destruction of Lot's wife? Open your mouth, Lot. Open your mouth, fathers. Open your mouth, mothers. Open your mouth, Christian. Don't continue in silence. If someone's coming to the piano this evening for the invitation, for the music, I'll just say here, don't bear the inevitable fruit of the closed-mouthed Christian. Lot's silence bore the fruit of expected compliance. They thought he was just going to do whatever they did. They took it as affirmation. His silence brought them exasperating inconsistency. It brought them an escalated confrontation. It brought evangelistic coldness, and it eventually brought them extreme calamity. And I'll ask you tonight, are you going to continue in his footsteps? Are you going to bear the same fruit? Are you going to stand silent? Or will you speak his praises? The altar call is simple tonight. Are you going to be a lot? Or are you going to be an Abraham? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the warnings that you give us, dear Lord. I pray you would please help us to heed it. I pray you'd help us to open our mouths for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. As the music plays, let's stand and there's a time of invitation.